I remember the confusion that I went through. I remember the fear that I had as a child. And that was something we just didn't want our son to go through. So we were honest with him. We spoke to him about life in terms that he could understand, of course, at his level. But we never told him that daddy was sick. Those were important words to avoid. We always said that daddy was diagnosed with cancer. Hello, and thank you for joining me here on Hope to Recharge podcast, the podcast that's designed to break the stigma around mental health and to create some hope and inspiration and give some practical tips to those that are struggling with mental health, whether it's from personal stories to break the stigma or some advice from professionals in the mental health community. Whether you are struggling with mental health on your own or you know a loved one that is struggling, we are here to support you and to create a community so you you know you are not alone. The road to recovery can be difficult and challenging. At Hope to Recharge, we believe that in mental health, together is always better. I'm your host, Matana. Thank you for joining me here today. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Are you looking for online therapy? Are you stuck at home like everyone else? High stress, high anxiety, worried about the future, trying to navigate everything, have a lot of worries, had a lot of emotional roller coaster rides up and down, just like me. BetterHelp.com is one phone call away, one Zoom call away, one text away. It's an online platform for therapy. It's so perfect for now, for coronavirus, for what people are going through now, we can reach out and get the perfect therapist that meets our needs. Don't wait. Check them out. See if you can find somebody. Don't struggle. They're so affordable. They are so affordable. You're sitting at home. Every therapist is working online now. Reach out and get help you need. If you are struggling, don't struggle in silence. I am so grateful that they are giving us 10% off the first month so you can get affordable access to therapy. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Start your wellness, get help, get support you need. On this episode of the Hope to Recharge podcast, we welcome Maria Quiban weitzel Maria greets millions of Los Angeles viewers daily each morning as Fox 11's meteorologist. Prior to joining the Good Day LA Fox 11 morning news team, she was the chief weather anchor for the Orange County News Channel and before that, meteorologist for NBC Hawaii News 8 in Honolulu, Hawaii. Maria is an Emmy Award-winning news anchor and broadcast meteorologist and is also familiar to many around the world from her appearances in film and television, including Clint Eastwood's Blood Work, Bruce Almighty, Step Brothers, Criminal Minds, Cold Case, and many others. Maria is also the author of a recently published book, You Can't Do It Alone, A Widow's Journey Through Loss, Grief, and Life After. In this episode, Maria will be discussing overcoming grief and moving on in life after losing her beloved husband, Sean. And now your host of the Hope to Recharge podcast, Matana. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me here again on Hope to Recharge podcast. As you know, July and probably August will be all about the topic of grief, overcoming grief, processing grief. How do we walk through grief and come out alive? We grieve someone that dies, that passes away, and sometimes part of us dies with them. But how do we continue living? How do we continue moving forward? And I read this book this week. The title of the book is You Can't Do It Alone. You Cannot Do It Alone. And it just sums it up so perfectly. I have Maria with me here today. I'm so grateful beyond words that she took off time from her very busy schedule. I feel like I'm um, I'm having a conversation with a celebrity today. We were chit-chatting before. I never get nervous before an interview, never, ever. And I just come with the intention. But today I was telling Maria that my internet went down yesterday in the middle of when we were wrapping up a recording. And I said, oh my God, Maria's taking off a very big chunk of her. She's very sought after now because of her new book and it's helping so many people. And I, I wanted to get her on so badly And I said, but what if my internet goes bad? And I'm like, I had to go back to my original core values. Everything's meant to be, whatever happens, happens. But the good part is that because she's a meteorologist, she understands that weather can be really tricky for people and we're not in control of the weather. So 
as I'm speaking to her and I'm telling her about what happened yesterday, I'm like, oh my God, she gets me. She's going to understand if the internet goes out because of a, wet, a storm that comes. I'm living in Boca now. There's never, we don't really have the warning, even though Google tells us, even my two year old says, okay, Google, what time is it going to rain today? My two year old. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, right, because they know online. I know it, you. You live in a place where it rains now every afternoon. It's it's right. uh, part of the the daily afternoon thunderstorms. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we never know if it's going to um, cut our electricity or not. the the th The thunderstorms here are like nowhere else I've ever seen in my in my life. It, it shakes everybody to the core. I was telling Maria that I was nervous. Then I had to just say, whatever will be, will be. And that's it. But I'm so grateful for Maria because her book gave me so much clarity in my journey of non-grieving. The Like I haven't, I was telling Maria, I'd never really grieved a close loved one besides a very dear friend of mine that passed away that I never said goodbye to. So I was like, it was like a very strange grief. And a grandparent that lived by us, but I was too young to understand grief. But now when the world is going through COVID and also when I'm so involved with this, with a mental health world and suicide awareness and death by suicide and COVID and relationships that are going. Oh, yeah. Right here, right, right in front of us. Right. Yeah. Right. So I said, I started up even before it was right before Corona that I started obsessing with grief. I went to Celine Dion's concert right before Corona, like two weeks before Corona. I, I told my audience this before, but I'm going to say it again. And when she spoke about courage, it was the Celine Dion concert was all about courage. She called it courage and she sang her new song that she talks to courage, how he cannot leave her alone now. Courage needs to walk with her now after she lost her husband and she needs to show up in the world and she needs to keep on performing and doing her dream. And those words of courage like went like a knife into my heart. And I remember coming home and telling my husband, my husband's Ar name is Ari. And I said, Ari, if you die... I die with you. Ah, uh, well, he, you have little ones to live for, just like I do, and Celine Dion, and you know, you, you. What I've learned um, through this whole thing, we are stronger than we think we are. And even in that moment when you think there's no way I can take another piece of bad news, there's just no way that I'm going to be able to live through this, but. But you do. And that's what my husband would have wanted for us and what he still wants for us. And that's what drives me to keep going. And exactly what you say, we keep on going. When we hit that point, I feel, I shouldn't say we, because I didn't experience it, but my fear is experiencing it. I have so much fear on 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 grief and how am I going to survive grief? But, but we, at the time, we have to say we're doing it for others. And eventually we realize that we're doing it for ourselves. But we don't, we don't want to give us that gift in the beginning because we're like, are we worthy without this person? Like what's life without this person? It's a whole new existence. We tell ourselves we're going to do it for our children. We're going to do it for the, and then the next step we're doing it for the person that left because they're going to, they want us to live. They want us to continue. So we don't, don't want to end their legacy when they, their physical body went, but their spiritual being is still here. Absolutely. You're still, um, I can tell you're super young, but it's part of life. And that's what we need to talk about more. So I'm so thankful for your show and others that I've met who have had um, really this time, this platform to talk about what is a part of life. And that is death. With us, it was just so unfortunate that and for many people, especially now during the time of COVID, is that people are taking away from us what seems like in a really powerless situation, which is what happened with us, I felt like. And I, I, I think the book, I'm so glad it resonated with you. And I hope that it will resonate with others and will shine a light for the path that all of us eventually will have to take. As you said, and I wrote a quote, I don't know if you saw the meme, as I was reading the book, it would describe towards the end like moments in life that suddenly catch you um, with your son and you real you didn't think that you're going to grieve so deeply and it's going to hurt so much and suddenly something happens you're like you go into that deep sadness again after you think that you came so long and it just something so small like the way um Sean your husband used to play with your son and you're like oh and you said something to him and I made a meme out of it with your book because it was so powerful and you write 
you wrote, life is about losing sometimes. And you were talking to him about competition, uh, games. But for me, life, when you said that, I'm like, did she realize that she was saying lo- losing sometimes means a loved one that you lose and you continue? Life is part of losing sometimes. Like we have to lose and still live. Do you remember saying that? I do, um, because I was remembering how Sean had actually sat down with Gus. It's so multi-layered. Thank you for pointing that out. I didn't even realize the the depth or the layers of that statement, but Sean was actually talking to Gus. Luckily, I think I got that on video, how Gus was crying about losing a game that they were playing. And I'm so glad that Sean took the time to explain to him that you know, daddy doesn't let him win all the time. Life is like that. You know, life is about losing sometimes. And you actually have highlighted that you're right. It it actually pertains to the theme of the whole book, which yes. is to lose our loved ones as well. And that is a part of life. Yeah. I was like, oh my God. God, life. And it starts with life. That means you, you, when you're losing, you still live life. It's part of life. Loss is part of life. And yes, we have to te- teach our children what you were teaching your son then, which is it's okay. It's okay to lose. And not only it's okay, it's important to know how to lose and move forward. When we talk to our children, it's about the small steps of losing a game, not doing well on a test, losing a friend for somebody else, or dating and losing somebody. You talk about that in your beginning of the book. But then I was like, yes, life is about continuing life after loss. And that's your book. And that is the essence of your book. I was telling you before that part of the the book, Five Star Plus Plus Plus, for me was that you brought the therapist in, your therapist, right? She's your therapist, right? You know what? She's not our personal therapist, although Lauren has become that. She's become such a great friend. I met her through our own uh, family counselor. And it's funny how life will take you in this circle. But when Sean and I first uh, got his diagnosis that crazy day, that week, um, we were recommended to seek counseling right away, which I firmly believe in, by the way, which we can talk, talk about more in, in a little bit. But Lauren works for... Um, a grief center. It's called Our House and they have offices around the country. And I remember meeting their uh, people. And so she was recommended early on, but we went and found someone else that really specialized or that we clicked with at the time. And so I'm so grateful for Betsy, who is our still our family counselor. But Lauren, who has a wealth of knowledge, kind of came in at the end and saved the day because originally it was going to be our therapist who was going to be with it. But there's just there was just a conflict. And 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 I think it was better this way to have um, Lauren uh, participate in the book. But she really does provide the feedback, right, from our, our individual chapters and our stories. And she takes what we learned and what we experienced and really brings it and makes it more universal for everyone. And I'm so glad that that you, um, it really spoke to you in in that way, because that's what I was really hoping for, that the book was going to be able to provide information, not just for people who have suffered um, a cancer or a death even, but just any loss in life. Yeah. And this book, it's like a combination of so many different aspects. There's, you're not alone. I get you. I'm going to give you the professional opinion of Laura Schneider, the therapist, at the end of every chapter that sums up, that makes it so clear for us to write notes. What do I need to do? And she says, this is what you should probably look into. There's like step by step. So there's also the emotional aspect and also the aspect of guidance, which is so important because with grief, I feel like there's such a loss and we're so consumed with this pain that we don't have direction. We just want to leave the pain. We want to go through, we want to just process it, but we don't know how. So there's the aspect of the counseling that you talk about a lot, the finding the group, finding the friend, finding the support. A lot of this book is about, you can't do it alone. Find the support, find the people, your, your tribe that will walk you through this darkness. But also what was so powerful is when we're, as somebody that struggled with mental health and depression, I needed people to tell me, 
X, Y, Z is what you need to do next because my brain wasn't telling me. I was so fogged up with pain, I couldn't take a step without somebody guiding me. And what Lauren does in the book is yeah. that. It's so important to have mental health wellness checks. And I, I'm a big proponent and supportive of everyone having, you know, help with their emotions and their heart. I mean, we all go see our kids go see a, a doctor at least once or twice a year, right? For wellness checks. Um, we go to the dentist at least twice a year. We go and get hair. We make appointments to get our hair done at least once every couple of months. So we should really mandate that. We all need to have some kind of counseling. And without it, our family, I really believe, would not have been able to understand and cope with the challenges that came with with life. In our situation, we had a young son. And so finding the language to tell him what was going on with daddy, with a disease, with dying, I just know that without our personal counselor, I would not have had the tools to be able to speak to him. Even for instance, just to say that daddy had cancer. Our natural instinct would be to try to shield our children, to try to protect them right from something bad. Um, so what we learned was to be 100% honest with him. And he was three at the time. And I really firmly believe this because when I was a child, unfortunately, when I was seven, I was almost eight years old. My, my own birth father died in an accident. I remember the confusion that I went through. I remember the fear that I had as a child. And that was something we just didn't want our uh, son to go through. So we were honest with him. We spoke to him about life in terms that he could understand, of course, at his level, but we never told him that daddy was sick. Those were important words to avoid. We always said that daddy was diagnosed with cancer. We told him that mommy didn't have cancer and that uh, Gus is his name, that Gus didn't have cancer and it was only daddy. So those are the kinds of things that you want to make sure that your child understands so that there isn't this fear that starts to grow, um, which can affect them well into adulthood. So that was one thing that we wanted to make sure. And yeah. that's one of the things that you wouldn't have clarity if not for your therapist guiding you how to share the diagnosis and how to share this process with your son. Right, right. Honesty, you know, you have little kids. You, you cannot hide things from little kids. You, you think you're being so clever as a parent. And I remember coming home from our monthly doctor's appointments and, and feeling really sad about that particular result of the scans or whatever. And as much as we wanted to ignore that and not tell him, we told him, you know, hey, we just went to the doctor. We didn't get good news, but here's what we're going to do to try to make it better. Here's how we're going to try to fix what we can. So, you know, those are the kinds of things we would do, but we would never try to hide from him the big things in life that we were going through at the time. One yeah. of the things you mentioned in the book is you know where your child is based on their questions. So meet them where they're at. They're going to guide you for what they need to hear, but don't, don't hide and prepare them for whatever is coming because when you're not preparing them, you're robbing them for the ability to process. Right, exactly. And um, my rule of thumb that I learned through all of it is that if your child is old enough to ask the question, then they're old enough to hear the answer. So, um, the trick is just finding the right language or the words to... Um, you know, make sure they understand what's going on truly. Anyway, do you want me to go back and, and, and tell everybody what? Yeah. So I'm going to, yeah. So the book, I don't want to give away the whole book because I think that they need to read it and it's so well written, but I want to just give a little history of, if you could give a few minutes of a history about pre Sean quickly, how you met Sean, because they have to read it because it's such a phenomenal story. And his essence of what he was and how that first like light bulb that went on that said, something's wrong. Like maybe we need to go find out. And, and then I'm going to lead you with questions from there about the diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you that I was, we were so ill prepared for this kind of news and um, we were living our 
I like to say in the book, are, are happily ever after, you know, at that time. So before I met Sean, I was a single parent. I was divorced. I had a teenage son. He was 16 at the time. And so I was really at a good place in my life and I wasn't necessarily wanting to remarry. Um, I was doing well with my career. I was very content at where I was. And so that night that I met Sean was a fateful night. Anyway, it was kind of a setup, but it wasn't. And, and, and we almost didn't meet that night, but we ended up meeting. And when we met, it was, it was a really special moment. I didn't know for sure, like this was the guy I was going to get married and spend the rest of my life with, but I knew that he was someone really special. And I knew right away from his smile, the way he spoke to me, that he was a person that had good values. And we shared a lot of common things like the love of Bruce Springsteen and, and, and songs. And, and anyway, we got along so well. We, worked out some issues. Um, he was set in his ways. I was, anyway, we, we got to this place where we decided to get married. We decided to have another child. And that was difficult because I was a little bit older. Um, having a kid in your early 40s, as you know, is, is, is hard. So we did all that. We, we somehow got the miracle of, of little Gus. And things were going really well. Now, well, fast forward to uh, before the diagnosis, Gus was three years old. We were both uh, working a lot. We're both working parents. And so we didn't spend a lot of time together like most uh, two working parents in a household. So that year, Sean turned 50 and he, there were some odd behavior, I think, leading up to that time, but it, it wasn't that drastic. We attributed it to him turning 50, some anxiety about that. Uh, he had just gotten a new job. He was actually a writer professionally, not me. He was supposed to be the one to write this book. Anyway, Gus was three, we decided, you know what, for his 50th birthday, his wonderful brothers gifted him with a trip to Paris. We had both never been to Paris. And so we take this amazing trip together. My parents flew out to be with Gus. And it was on this trip that we found each other again 24-7, right? So we were together from morning to night. I realized that he was acting oddly. He didn't want to wake up early like he usually would. He was the one that planned our itineraries when we were on vacation. He was usually up before I was because he would usually write in the morning and then go to the gym and then come wake me up. When we're on vacation, I'm the one that goes to sleep the whole day because <laughs> I wake up so early for my job. So anyway, he wasn't doing any of that. So that was very odd. He um, also was somebody who got who lived in New York for a long time. And for him to not be able to hail as a cab was very odd. So every day when we were on this trip, things felt worse and worse for me when, when we were together, like he would get lost, he would forget his phone. It was just, it was way more than just being forgetful. So by the end of the trip, I was in tears and I said, honey, you've got to promise me that you're going to see a doctor. And he, he even he agreed. And so by the time we landed from this trip, exactly two weeks from the day, uh, he went to the doctor finally that um, asked him to get some brain scans. And that's when we were called to the brain tumor surgery center. And that was when we were showed his tumors in his brain. And apparently that's what was causing all of the um, confusion and the weird behavior. So unbeknownst to us, it was probably growing for about a year and a half or so. And they were deep in his brain and they were inoperable. So he was diagnosed with uh, terminal incurable brain cancer. It's a glioblastoma. And um, I'm hoping that by writing this book, I can shine this, the light on the need for a cure for this disease, which, by the way, will um, affect young, old, white, black, anyone, um, and take your life quickly within months um, in many cases. You, you speak about in the book about that diagnosis of glia, gliobastoma, I can't even say it properly, gliobastomas. You say GBM. Those Okay, GBM, GBM. Okay. I actually met a person that speaks about his journey. And I now, after reading your book, I understand 
a little bit more what he was talking about. And the fact that he's walking and talking after the surgeries, what a miracle it is. What a miracle it is. Um, but you speak about that first, like, I would say grieving when you got the diagnosis. The diagnosis starts at the doctor's appointment when they tell you what's going on. Yeah. Well, it's when they tell you that it's it's inoperable and it's incurable uh, and terminal, all those words just come hitting you like you've been run over and and it's a shock to your system. And so, you know, at first we didn't want to believe it. And because it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, there are no outward signs really, other than just some of the odd behavior. But um, we went through this, it was quick, but we did go through it. It was terrifying. It was um, anger. We had so much anger for, for the world, for, for God. And, and couldn't understand why this was happening to us and to him because uh, he was healthy. He was young. He did everything right. We both tried to be good people. And, and, and so we couldn't understand why, you know, as, as, as Christians that this could happen. But as we know, it, God doesn't make bad things happen to people. It just, it is what it is. And um, I forgot your question. <laughs> no, I'm saying that the grief starts when you get the diagnosis, when they're still alive. Yeah, because when you hear those words like terminal and everything, um, that's when you really do start to grieve the life that you know you're not going to have. And with brain cancer specifically, I've met so many people along the way now. And the way brain cancer works, it's it's probably, I hate to say it, but it, I think it's worse than any other cancer because it attacks the essence of who you are and that is your brain. And so for many people, those changes in the personality and it, it physically can happen so quickly and and so that grieving process and as you lose your loved one right before your eyes really it makes sense that the grieving begins then yeah absolutely and and one of the things that i was thinking about is they need support more than anything and as well as the caretaker needs support but when it's a child i think it's easier to love unconditionally when it's a spouse that you choose to love based on their virtues and then their virtues change, like the way you described that he was uh, a little bit anxious and an out, an outburst that were so out of character. How do you continue loving something that's changing and you have to nurture them to, till they die? Mm -hmm. That's such a, because you're not getting in back any real love while they're going through the treatment. Isn't that such a hard balance? Well, I definitely felt the love from Sean. We were very lucky and fortunate that his behavioral changes were very slight. And I'm so grateful that we never truly lost who he was from the start to the end. Once we understood what was going on with him, then the behavior and, and the, the changes in behavior made sense. And so that never affected how we felt about each other. If anything, it our bond grew stronger. Honestly, there was a moment and there continued to be moments where you do, as a caregiver, express that frustration. Not so much to Sean. I, Sean was wonderful throughout the whole thing and he never complained, not once. And so whenever I felt moments of, of weakness or frustration or even just wanting to give up, there was no way that I could because Sean never wanted to give up. And he withstood the effects of those treatments and he sacrificed because of his love for us. And, and I never took that lightly. And um, our love grew and it deepened even more. And it was at a place where I couldn't imagine that I, we already felt this incredible sense of love for each other, that to imagine it getting even deeper was, was hard. Like how could it be any more? But it, it did, it, it grew even more. And that's why I'm so grateful 
for that time, even as hard as it was. I am grateful for that because I don't think I would have ever experienced that deep of a love had that not happened to us. Yeah, they say the biggest form of love is giving. And I always say it's really hard to love someone before marriage because the big giving is through the tests of life and seeing how we overcome things together. It's not through buying roses and chocolates and vacations. It's the overcoming the challenges and figuring out and understanding each other. That's the real love. The successes in the hardship is what brings the love. Yeah, a hundred percent. What you said before struck me so much, and I wish uh, it's a little bit off topic of of grief of in general. But I think this for my audience that all struggle with supporting loved one with mental health issues and and um, mental illnesses. And you said something so beautiful when you realized that it wasn't him and it was his brain. The empathy and compassion came out, and the, you understood it wasn't him. And with mental illness, it's our brain. It's like a brain injury, just like a brain cancer taking over. Yes, it is a brain injury. It is a brain disease. Uh, his actions, some of Sean's actions, I mean, leading up to the diagnosis, I was confused by, like you mentioned, there was an outburst. There were moments of, of conflicts that I couldn't understand. But later in hindsight, I got it. Like, oh, that was the... That was the tumor that was making him behave that way. So I yeah. think it's important that people remember that mental illness is like a brain tumor, that it, it's in different shapes and forms, but it affects our brain that we can't control it all the time. And when we're dealing with loved ones that that have, let's say, bipolar or different or depression that comes and goes without them knowing, it's not that they're in control of it. And when we see it, and I hope one day people can see it like in a way, brain cancer that takes over the brain and they can't really control it. And we should love them for who they are in their good times yes. and continue bringing it into the hardship. That's why it's so important to have counseling to understand exactly what's going on, right? you as the, as, as the person and then your family around you. One of the things you speak about in the book is that you decided with, I think with your counsel, maybe it was the group. I don't remember if it was the group or your therapist that you decided that you're going to start living life as if every day is the last one. And you're going to bring joy into every day, not wait for the death, but live the now as high as possible power and make it even more powerful than you said, Linda, a lifetime experience with someone for 120 years, right? So you brought that, that joy into the now with all the hardships and with all the pain and the struggles and the fear of death. And you also talk about the gratitude. I, I understand that it's beautiful and it's so nice to do it, but how do you actually pause during pain and say, I'm going to choose joy. And you use the word joy, which is higher than happiness. Yeah. No, we definitely were, were able to get there. And even when it was actually Dr. Renna who had um, uh, talked to us about that, that day, and we had all kinds of emotions that day because we were hoping he would come with some great news for us about some clinical trial or some kind of new treatment that we had overlooked or couldn't find. And what he basically did for us was, um, it was sobering and he gave us a real uh, reality check on what was to come with this disease. And he was the one that said, you have to look at this diagnosis and as a gift because no one gets a timeline we all live in the hypothetical about how we should live in the moment and we should carpe diem and seize life. Like we all, up until that moment, we did too. We always tried to live for the moment, lived each day as it was our last, but it's always in the hypothetical, right? You don't really know if that's your last, but the fact of the matter is we, um, had some idea of our timeline, but even we didn't know. Exactly. So he kind of spelled it out for us that Maria, you could get hit by a bus, you know, next week. Sean may have this timeline of like 12 to 14 months, but 
you may not be around tomorrow. So honestly, we really seriously have to look at you, Sean and Maria, have to look at each day as if it's your, 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 a year and each month as, uh, or rather each day is a month and each month is a year. So he really broke it down for us about how we should approach life um, after we left his office. And even leaving the office, uh, like we looked at each other, Sean and I, and go, how the hell are we going <laughs> to Oh, really? I thought it came so naturally to you. Oh, not at all. I mean, no, it's, it was, it was hard. It, it felt like an impossible uh, situation to be able to do that. We went home and in Sean fashion, he's very positive and he's so optimistic most times. And so he said, well, let's give it one hell of a try. Uh, yeah. So we would, um, you know, every night before we went to bed, we would take an inventory of what we did that day. We would take a look and list exactly what we did from the time we woke up to that moment we were in bed. And we would say, we did this, we did that. We, oh, do you know that story about this? And so then after a little while, we realized that we did achieve a lot in that day, in that week. And we laughed about those moments and you would think that there would be nothing to laugh about when you're going through the kind of harrowing treatments that he went through. But we did. When you make a point to, to look, they're there. And so we genuinely and organically uh, found those moments, which inevitably, A, made us feel better. B, built more memories that we can look back on for each other and for Gus and for our big extended family. And um, we just felt better. Like we genuinely felt those endorphins that, that um, you would normally feel in other situations. And so I, when I talk about it now with you, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of taken back to, the, to those moments. And, and, and I feel good right now, even thinking back to it. So it does work. It works. There's a lot of gratitude during and after. Yeah. And I hold on to those because there are days when I do feel really bad and really sad and depressed and and when those days come you know i just have to acknowledge it and go to myself oh there it is okay i i see you i recognize that trigger and why i feel this way i just embrace it and have a good cry and then inevitably i feel better after you know and that's life grief is universally one of the more powerful, intense emotions. Some people, whether due to trauma or conditions like borderline personality disorder, experience all of their emotions on the more intense end of the spectrum, which can be challenging without some support and guidance. For those who frequently experience emotional dysregulation or emotional sensitivity, there is an online dialectical behavior therapy skills solution Dialectical Behavior Therapy Skills, or DBT skills, are essentially emotional coping skills. Check out EmotionallySensitive.com for more information. They have weekly, online psychoeducational DBT skills groups, attended by students around the globe, and co-facilitated by a licensed DBT-trained therapist and a DBT-trained certified life coach who is in recovery from borderline personality disorder herself. Please visit EmotionallySensitive.com to learn more and ask any questions you may have about their next program, which starts on July 27th. Enrollment closes at noon Pacific on Sunday, July 26th. Again, Visit us at EmotionallySensitive.com, and we hope to have you in class with us very soon. But it's a choice. It's a choice to see the, the to focus. I'm not saying we, we have to always be in the, we have to feel the feelings that are coming. But the, the our choice is, are we going to focus on the negative or are we going to focus on the positive? Because there's always both. There's always both both, but our brain is really good in focusing on the scary, anxious, doomsday, but it's not so good at hyper-focusing on what's here right now that's positive. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's why my support group is so important to me too, Um, which by the way, we still get together. I was so reluctant to go in the beginning when I would see the flyers in the hospital about brain tumor caregiver support group. I mean, it was very specific. Specific, yeah. For me right now. Yeah, it was so specific. And I thought, what what would this... It wasn't even just a support group for those with cancer or whatever. It was very specific to brain tumor patients, caregivers. My only regret is that I didn't go sooner believe it or not. And it was through this support group that I was able to not just learn more about the disease, but really learn about other people, uh, their journey. And uh, we still today, to this day, get together. Uh, Well, now, obviously, with the pandemic, we can't, but we had a a, a Skype or a Zoom meeting a few weeks ago. And and they really are just my, my village, part of my village. I'm so grateful for them. One of the things that I wanted to ask you when I was reading about your group and there, and each one is in a different, you, you write so beautifully how each one is in a different stage with the introdu- with the whole brain tumor history. Like, is it the beginning? How bad is it? What's their family structure? How long is it taking? What's their, what's their treatment? Every, and some are after the loss already, after the death. Some got remarried, some found love again, some went traveling again. My, my immediate question was, when someone is feeling so depleted and needing for support, how do they honestly give support to someone else when they're like, what am I going to tell you that you're going to really have a sucky future because you're going to lose someone and you're going to cry all the time and going to wish that they come back? Like, how do we Give support when we feel depleted. You know, they, uh, it could be just as simple as, hey, I'm, I'm just listening. Like that is even enough just to say, I'm here. I see you. I hear your, your frustration and your fear of the unknown. And I'm here. Like that many times was more than enough for me. Just knowing that they know what I'm going through. That sometimes is all you need in a support group is merely just having your hand held while you express and cry and get mad and swear. But somehow there's, you know, you have pieces of energy that you can expend. Um, I don't know. You just find it somehow. It's, it's like, when you have another child, you know, do you think you can have love for another child when you love this one so much? When you think that you couldn't possibly have any more energy for anything else other than what you're doing at home for your for your loved one that you're caregiving for, you do find the energy to be with your support group, to be with, to spend some time with your friend or your fam- your friends or your family because you need that too. That feeds you actually and gives you more energy, believe it or not. I know it did for me. You speak about a lot about your um, Sean's family and your family and how they were your rock and support. And until today, you call them and you're so happy that you have them and they're the continuation of Sean. Like you still get together for holidays or you, you check in with each other all the time. The uncles that are, that they can't be like the father figures. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, she was really lucky. She really had a huge support. And with all that support, you went for counseling. I think it's very important that people should, should understand that there's different um, ways of support. It's not only the professional. It's not only the family. It has to be everything together. Yeah, it's it's multifaceted. And I do understand how fortunate I am that I have this support system that's built in with our family, our friends, even my work. I know that there are many people who don't have that. But I will say this, if you're listening and you think, Maria, I don't have the kind of family that you have. I don't have uncles or brothers or, or, um, you know, the kind of family unit that you have. Well, here's what I would say. We live in a, in in a time in this world now, especially during this pandemic, 
that we can reach out and find our village. We can reach out and find our support group through the numerous resources that are out there. And does it take work? Absolutely. Does it take work to stay connected with your family and your friends? Absolutely. I find that by me communicating with my friends and family was a way for them to help me. It was a way that they could understand what was going on through our day. So I think you also have control as the caregiver, as the person. So for me, that meant sending out an email every month, at least maybe once or twice a month. And I would send an email and I would write everything that happened, what I needed. Even if I didn't write what I needed, I would just write what was happening. And that way, no one had to wonder what was happening. So I gave them the tools in order to be connected to me and to help them help me. Do you you understand what I mean? Absolutely. I actually interviewed somebody yesterday and I I always ask this question. People that didn't really have um, loss or don't know how to grieve properly or they don't know what it is to grieve because they didn't go through it. Uh, For me, I always wonder like, Am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I going to hurt them? Should I ignore them? Should I, should I, should I bring them things? Should I, should I overdo it? Like what, what should I do? And I find myself that I don't know. And the, and I said, what do we do when we don't know? So this person said, brilliant, Amos, she said, as you as a person that's grieving, tell the world what you need and be specific. Be specific is a really important point not to miss. Yes. Yeah, be specific about it. Ask for help. I know that we want to do things on our own. Most of us tend to be very strong, you know, especially women. I, I, well, actually both men and women. We, I can do it. I don't need anyone's help. But we do. We need other people. We're built to be with other people and to have a village. So ask for it. And I find that when you ask for it, people are willing and want to help because helping is healing. And on so many levels, it it heals for me. I'm hoping that the book can help people. It helps my heart. And when people help me or when you help others, doesn't it make your heart feel good? Yeah, a purpose. Purpose. And so ask for help and, and people will willingly want to do it because they that they understand the return that it brings for them as well. And I think it's important to voice, if you're having a day that you want to disconnect, just voice it and say, today, I just want to disconnect. But I appreciate the fact that you check in on me or all these things because there's no, everybody grieves differently. And this is going into my next uh, conversation with you, but everybody grieves differently. And there's no proper book that can tell you step one, two, three, four. There are different steps like David Kessler's book, but there's, but everybody is in different stages and different times, and every and two people in the same family can grieve differently for the the loss of the same person. But communicate, communicate, communicate with the support that you have around you what you really need because it's so important. And so much hurt comes from the miscommunication. Yep, totally. I love that you brought up David Kessler, whom I met uh, and, and and got his book uh, just recently. Just, just a few months ago, I'd like to think that we've become friends. He's so amazing. And his last or most recent book called Finding Meaning really put me in a good place because it was right as I was finishing my book. He really does spell it out about the stages and it isn't chronological. It's, it can be, it's a, it's, it's a, um, it's a cycle and uh, it's cyclical and, and it can, you can go in and out of each stage at any given moment. And it's interesting, I was just with some family uh, recently in Iowa. We always used to go to Iowa uh, for the 4th of July, which is where my late husband is from and his whole family. And there was a support group there that um, his mom is, is a part of. And it was interesting, once again, I was reminded how these were people who had lost a loved one 20 years ago, 25 years ago, five years ago, and you wouldn't even know it looking and, and, and hearing them talk because that pain never goes away. You just, you just kind of get used to living with it, I suppose. And um, I'm learning, you know, as I go, and I know right now it's four and a half years, but sometimes it feels like 
just four months ago, you know? Right. So one of the things that I always ask grieving um, friends or people like you, I ask, how do we hold on to hope when we know that this pain, yes, it's going to have different shapes and sizes and it's going to come in different waves and different times. But how do we know that until the end of my life, I will feel some kind of loss and pain? It's never going to go away. No, it doesn't. Um that's a really good question. Uh, I'm I'm hoping and I'm praying that it will get easier in time to live with it. I recently met Joe Biden. I do write about this a little bit in the book. Yes, yes. And um, it was a moment where I was feeling super, super sad. And he, and, and the book will go into more of what we talked about, but I just remember him saying to me, you are going to say Sean's name one day and not cry and smile instead. He goes, I, I don't know how long it will take. It may take a year or two or five, but someday. And he goes, I know because I've been through it. And he was right because his wife had actually died in that accident when his kids were along with his daughter. And then his son, who died um, from brain cancer, same thing. And he said, one day you will smile instead of cry. And so I hold on to that. Today, I still tear up. I still get very emotional when I talk about Sean, really. But I hold on to that hope that one day I will smile first um, mm. or I cry. Wow, that's powerful. I'm happy you brought up the the story of Joe Biden because I had such a I had a question. I'm like I'm writing down this question because I don't I don't understand. And it's going to take me into this next question that I have for you. So you mentioned in the book that you lost your father when you were very young. So you were basically going through what your son is going through. And there's also the the projection. Like I know what it feels like to lose a father because I went there. So it's not the unknown. There's it's very known. So one of the things that you say in the book, it's a multi-question here, right Right here, okay? So one of the things that you say, talk about in the book is to make sure that your child knows that you're not sick. The person that passed, passed, yes. He, he's gone from our lives, but our, his spirits will be here. I'm still okay. I'm still well. I'm going to take care of you. And never put the burden of being the take, um, caretaker on, that the child doesn't have to take care of the parent, that they shouldn't have to be the vessel of walking the role model of the parent that they lost, right? Did I get that correct? Yes. You had the projection of you, what it felt like and protecting your child in a way like, I know what the pain feels like. I, I, I don't want him to go through the pain I went through and I'm going to give him the security. And that's why you went to counseling to find out like, what am I going to do right for my child? And one of the tips that you got is make sure that they don't feel like they need to be the father to hold the pain for you. But what Joe Biden said was exactly what you were not supposed to say, but you liked that he said it. But he said was your, tell me what exactly the words, because I don't want to mess it up. No, I mean, listen, that is, that's what we do. And that's what we say, right? As a patriarch, Joe Biden's to Gus, you know, you are, are the man of the house now to that effect. And, and you take care of your mom. You know, that's, it was in the moment and that's what we tend to do, right? As adults, we tend to um, say, chin up kid, you know, wipe those tears away. And so these are the things that we grew up traditionally with. And that's why I think it's really important to seek counseling because really through experts and um, like David Kessler and Lauren Schneider know that we can't put that kind of pressure on little children. Um, they don't know any better. They just want to be children and know that they're going to be okay. And so I didn't have a real, I mean, Gus was five. I, he doesn't even remember that. No, for sure. Yeah. But, but that's why it's so important as a parent to have the right tools to speak to your child about. And, and for me, I had the gift of perspective. I know that as a young child, I did have some experience about losing a parent, 
very different situations. My my birth father died in an accident. It was a it was a boating accident, so he was taken from us very suddenly. I think with Gus, it's different, and I think better in a sense that he was able to a make more memories with dad, knowing that that the end was potentially very near. I captured a lot of, of, of it on video and I hope that this book will help him, I'm sure, as he grows up and tries to re- remember back to his dad. But for now, yes, I, I, I hopefully I'm making the right decisions and with the help of a counselor, making sure that Gus is uh, a well-adjusted kid. And I, and I think he is. Yeah. I actually liked what Joe Biden said, because I think that when we get, I think it's important, maybe I'm wrong because I never went through grief, but maybe it's important to get different messages from different people on different levels. So the mom has to be the one saying, you don't have to take care of me. I'm strong. I'm okay. We'll, We'll walk through this together. You're the child. I'll still take care of you. You don't have to take care of me. But at the same time, give from the outsiders to give empowerment to the children and say, you're the man, like, you, uh, like you'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I liked it. I, I really liked it. And it was such a, especially from someone that walked through grief to give that little like pat on the back, you'll be okay. You're, 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 you're going to grow up fast and, and, and you're a man and you could do it. Yeah. 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 He's going to have that to look back on, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did it be president or not? But, but- <laughs> Right. So one of the things that I had a very hard time and I was crying and I'm crying, crying reading in your book was when you sat near Sean and you gave him permission to leave. You speak about the in the book, the different um, times that you had to make decisions and the decisions was always made with him. You never made decisions that was good for you. You all, oh, even when he couldn't speak and even when he couldn't really communicate, squeezing your hand was, was a yes or a no. Like you had your little codes that you made and it's, you wrote so beautifully in the book and everybody should read it because I'm not doing justice to it. But my question is, how do we give permission to someone to, how do we remove the self selfish part of us that says, no, stick with me, stick with me, fight a little bit more, hope a little bit for a miracle. Tomorrow they're going to find a cure for this. Uh, some, some kind of crazy thing is going to happen and you're going to come back to us and you'll be able to speak and you'll be able to eat again and you'll be able to be with us again. When do, how do we walk that fine line of letting go yeah. of someone that we love so much and giving them permission and not being selfish, like, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This is where I think it's really important for everyone has their own way. As you mentioned, for me and for Sean, we uh, believe in God. We uh, have a very close relationship with our, our church and our priests, and we rely a lot on our faith. And so just knowing that Sean will be with our Heavenly Father and our Creator uh, makes it a little easier to say goodbye. I know that his body was failing him, his physical um, self. And so knowing that he would not be in any kind of pain and knowing that he would um, not be in this way anymore was was comforting and was made it easier to say goodbye. And so as his breathing got more and more labored, um, I knew that it was time. And I knew, I just felt it, that he was hanging on for us for a moment. And so um, I told him that we were going to be okay. And, um, you know, shortly after that, um, yeah, he he breathed his last breath. And uh, thankfully, I was there with him when that happened. But I think that's the biggest act of love, of of true love, is letting them go, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm a selfish person, probably. There are many times where, um, you know, I wouldn't hear about it. I didn't even want to hear anyone talk about that. But uh, ultimately, ultimately, your love for them and their love for you will will show you the way. And, and, and I did a lot of praying. I did a lot of praying. 
and asked for help. And uh, now I ask for help from Sean, for help from God and our loved ones who have passed. I, I always talk to, to Sean. And so I think to this day, he still helps to guide and, and show me, you know, some things that I need to be shown. Like writing this book, for instance, I, I'm not the writer in the family, although now officially I suppose I am, but there were many times where I wanted to just to, to quit. I didn't I didn't want to keep going. It was too painful to go back and relive some of those moments, like that moment when he took his last breath. And uh, I asked Sean to help me write this book, and and I think he did. I really do. I think he 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 did. It's interesting that you brought that up because that was my next question. Because you talk about talking and finding clues and connecting. And a lot of people write about that beforehand, they thought like when I watched Ghost, the movie Ghost, when I was a little girl, <laughs> all I could say, I, all I could see as a little girl, the frustration of the deceased, the person that died, that wants to come back into the life of the living. And they're just, there's this disconnection and they, there's such a connection, but disconnection between the afterlife and the now. And, and it was something that, that really freezes me in fear. What if when I pass away one day, what if I have something to say and I can't get the message across, but then I hear from you and other ones that they they look for messages. And it's not like we can talk regularly, but you talk about how you ask him for things and you communicate and 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 you talk to him in the car or before a meeting or whatever, you talk to him, right? I do. I mean, I talked to him for years. How could I have stopped like when when he wasn't here anymore? It's, it's it was an impossibility. So I didn't change too much. You know, I used to call him every day um, after work and I wasn't about to stop talking to him about my day. And I still do. You know, it's I think it's fine and I encourage Gus to do the same and, and our friends and family, because I'm telling you, it happens all the time. If I listen hard enough and look hard enough, he answers back. <laughs> he does. Our loved ones do. And I challenge anyone to, to do the same for any loved one that have, you know, that they've passed on because they will, they'll answer. Yeah. And David Kessler talks about it a lot that their body left us, but they're still they're still here with us. And when we we invite that idea and acceptance that their soul is still here, their what they came to the world to do is still here, and we're continuing the legacy. And by us living, continuing life, and not dying in sorrow and pain, is really an action of saying they're still alive. Right? They're still here. They're still with us. They're listening. They're feeling. And I think your example of the dating, I want you to tell this story because <laughs> it's such a good part that shows exactly, as you said, sometimes they answer so fast. They do. And, and remember, you were talking about being very specific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I used to talk to Sean about dating because at some point, I think it was in year two after he died, my my friends and and family of course you know gave me blessing to to go on and even Sean himself talked about it with me which i refused to listen and and even discuss it at the time but he wanted he said you know you i i know how much you want to share your life because that was really the foundation of our relationship i just i wanted to do everything with him like i didn't even go to the movies by myself cuz i just there's no point i want to share the experience and so yeah. So he would say, you know, I, I, please, I want you to find someone and, and share your life. So a couple years into it, my friends talked me into, um, removing my ring finally, which I did. It was weird, but I did do it. And I think it, I was ready at that point. But anyway, I was sitting down having a conversation with Sean and I said, you know, everyone's telling me about going on a date with, with people or going dating. You know, I said, so send me someone you're going to have to send me someone and they've, they've got to be able to spoil me, spoil me rotten with everything. And, uh, and lo and behold, it was a friend of a friend who reached out and invited me out. <laughs> so I'm like, what? That was fast. <laughs> it was right away. 
later that afternoon. So yes, what, what did you say? Did I run away? No, I said it was right away. It was right after your ass. It wasn't months later. It was right away that you got a, like, can you date us? Can, can we go on a date? And you said, I'm not going to date, but I'll, I'm, I'll meet you. <laughs> it was literally hours after the conversation I had with Sean. Yes, lesson, be careful what you ask for and then be specific if you are asking for something. And lesson three, they're listening and they're helping and they're seeing and they're smiling. And I think it's important for married people or people that are in a relation, in a loving relationship of like an intimate, re- what's the word? Maybe it's not intimate because we're intimate with a romantic, thank you, romantic relationship, whether you're married or not, have the conversation of when you know that there's going to be death coming. Like, no one knows for sure, but when it's the signs are coming and have the conversation and get that closure beforehand. Because usually the person that is dying wants you to move forward and they want you to remarry or, or find a loved one. They want you to have happiness because that is true love. They want the other one to love. And it brings me back to what I said before, that letting go of him was the true action of true love instead of selfless selfishness. It was seeing him. Yeah. And you no, know, thank you. And having that conversation before is important because it's the voice that's going to keep on coming back, right? I guess for some people, yeah, maybe, um, maybe if that's important. I know for me, I, I could take it or leave it. I would, I, I would never say never. I would never say no. Um, and I know that Sean, I know that our loved ones would want happiness for us, whatever that means. Even if you didn't have that conversation specifically, I, I, I'm very confident in, in knowing that our loved ones, when they pass, they want nothing but happiness for us. And so I take it one day at a time. And if someone were to come into my life, I have put the pressure on him. <laughs> Say, you will have to find someone special for it for us and um, put him in my path. And and then we'll see what happens. Oh, I have well, one of my last questions to you is you work in a place that's really hard to sh- hide your emotions because you're on TV. Yeah. You're on <laughs> um, Fox News every day, right? Five times. A, how many times a week do you? Yeah. Monday through Friday. I'm the morning meteorologist on Good Day LA. Yeah. And so... Yes, I typically, you know, as as the forecast will show most people, it's it's usually kind of the fun part of the newscast. It's it's I always joke that it's the part of the newscast that actually looks forward in time because everyone always talks about the past and what happened and bad news typically. Generally, I will talk about the future. So, so yeah. How, how many years are you doing that? I just marked my 20th anniversary with uh, Good Day LA. Wow. I know. I started when I was nine. <laughs> right? No. Oh my God. 20 years. Yeah. Wow. So they're your family. Yeah, they are. Many of them have become like real family. We, uh, we, we love each other. We fight like we're real family. We laugh and, and, uh, I'm so grateful for them. And even the ones that have moved on who are no longer there, we still stay in touch. And uh, they were there through the hardest part of my life, seeming, you know, at that time. And, and they were such a big part of my support system. And I couldn't have gone through all that, I don't think, without their constant support and love. And our viewers, I love our viewers here in not just in LA, but now because of technology, we really have viewers all around the world and they're, they've just been so loving and supportive. And I, and I thank them for that time when I was going through the most difficult times. And then today um, with all the love and support for the book and, and, and sharing um, about the book, I am so grateful for everyone. Our viewers are very special. So my, my, my question after that beautiful, like uh, painting of what, what you have spent 20 years doing, how, what happens like right after Sean passes and you're broken, you're just destroyed. You, you just don't have words to even talk. You, it's hard to drink, to eat, to sleep. How do you put on a face and go back to work? And you're, you're known for your smile. 
how do you do that? Like, how do you switch from grief to work, life? Well, um, you know, it took me a little while to get back to work, first of all. It did take me a couple of months, um, exactly. Actually, three months. That's not a lot. Uh, No, it was, (laughs) I had many moments, even on the air, where I had lost it. And and again, kudos to my my workmates for rescuing and and just showing me love and, and constant support. But I guess for me, it was being able to, even through Sean's illness, uh, is, is being able to compartmentalize and being able to really tell myself that, okay, now you're going to work and you have to put on this costume, you have to put on this hat. And this costume is this. And so you have to leave that and those emotions that go with caregiving and all that. Like you have to leave that in the car. And as I'm getting out of the elevator, I really take on or I took on this sort of different role. Inevitably that, well, that first smile was often forced, especially during that time, but inevitably it would turn into a real sincere and legitimate smile and gratitude for being there. Because frankly, part of it is that I needed a job. I need to work. I've got bills to pay. And you know, that's what most people go through. And and so you have to suck it up and go to work and you got to, you go, cause you need a paycheck. And these are the things we have to do. Yeah. And to know to not stay in the victim spot, but still get support. There's a fine line between getting support and hanging out in the pity party. And it's hard to know when it's time to leave that pity party and to say, okay, get back to work because it's good for you. Yeah. Well, that's why you surround yourself with people who are going to tell you the truth, right? um, who are going to be good counsel to you and can help you come to those decisions. Yeah. Because down, you do know, deep down, I knew, you know, when it was time to do this or that. Yeah, you do know, again, with help with counseling and, and, and our therapist and our church and everyone, um, you know, hopefully those decisions are the right ones. Maria, thank you so, so much for sharing, for making time for me. It was really a gift for me. Reading your book was a big gift. I obsessed the last four months, obsessed about grief. I That's why I'm in David Kessler's grief group, even though I didn't lose anybody. And I'm on different groups online. And I, I think I read every grief book out there. I just, I, and I and I'm talking to people about grief because I felt that, Part of me will never, because I know depression, I was in my past 10 years ago, I was hit with with debilitating depression, but before I didn't know anything about mental illness and I had three kids at the time and I knew that I needed to get back to life. I said, I don't know how, I don't know how I'm going to get out of bed again. I don't know if I'm going to swallow again. I don't know if I'll ever, how I'm going to be happy. I knew what sadness and black looks like. And I said, grief has to be worse. It has to be worse because there's no hope for them to return. For me, I could return to my old self, but grief, you, what are you returning to? To hopefully being okay without them, but there's not going back to being with them. And that's something that's so hard for me to process. And the, that was freezing me in fear of grief. So I decided to go deep into understanding grief, to find hope before it happens and to find tools before it happens, to know, to see people like you, to know that it really is hard and it's really something that no one wants to experience, but there is life after death. There is a future. There's hope. There's different kind of joy that comes after. You talk about the joy and gratitude that comes after appreciating things on a different level that you've never appreciated before. So I want to thank you, Maria for writing your book, for being a source of comfort for me, for my anxiety about grief that I thought that I'll never, ever be able to walk through it and survive because I'm so afraid of pain, emotional pain. I'm so afraid of it. And I avoided it almost at any price, but you can't avoid grief because it just happens in life. As you said so beautifully, life is about losing sometimes. And you gave such a beautiful gift to the world by your book. You can't do it 
alone. You cannot do it alone. Find your support, find your loved ones and find a different support, your friends, your family, the group, therapists, reading materials. You talk about the book that people gave you right away in the beginning, right? Yes. Yes. I did um, list some of those books. Um, You got to find it and, and keep trying. If you can't find it right away, Just keep looking. You will find your village and your people. Thank you so much for having me on today. How good you've been and this talk for my heart. And thank you so much for picking up my book and reading it and really taking it in. I can't tell you how it makes my heart heal and feel good. So I thank you. And I'm going to be giving it out as gifts. I think we have to know when to give this book out because it's very, it can be very fragile because a lot of people come to me after loss from suicide. And I feel like take this book, just inhale it. It's going to help. But also at the same time, they have to process it. So we have to know when it is. But I know I already told so many people about this book because it was so powerful for me, for someone that didn't walk through real grief yet. And hopefully not for many, 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 many years, but it gave me hope. And my last question that I ask everybody, and you kind of answered it before, but what does hope mean to you, Maria? What does hope mean to me? Hope is just, I guess, the promise of of love, more love, I guess, in our case and, and life. And also having daddy memories, having those loved ones' memories be a part of our lives is hopeful because those daddy memories that we made, I mean, people say, oh, it was only, you know, 18 months or whatever. It wasn't. It was a lot. It was, we lived each day like it was a month and each month like a year. So we had eight, we had a lifetime of memories that we actually experienced and shared. And so I just encourage everybody to um, recall and make more memories and live life and and know that that love um, is there for all of us. So you got to just ask for it sometimes and, and, and seek it out and ask for help because we can't do it alone. Mm. Can't. We can't. Do it together. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. If anybody's listening and knows a loved one that's going through grief or a friend or a neighbor, gift them this book. It could save their life and their family. Thank you for tuning in. Bye till next time. Thank you for joining us and taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Please hit the subscribe button so you can hear further episodes. If you are listening to us on iTunes, please leave feedback and ratings below. Let us know if there's any topic that you would like to hear from us in the future. Bye till next time.